Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Resistance Live for the 29th of August, 2017. I can't believe we're at the end of August. Um, and there's a little puppy upstairs making some noise because she wishes she was down here talking to all of you. So if you happen to hear her in the background, I apologize. It's Elizabeth Cronice from Bluffland. Um, uh, let's see. Um, first things first, we're coming down to our last few weeks of early bird pricing on our fall boot camp for activist leadership. So if you want to join us, go to GaiaLeadershipProject.com backslash rise. Uh, we also have all of our speaking tour in California coming up in about two and a half weeks. Um, you can get last tickets. Like we've got like under five left in San Francisco, I think, and still a bunch left in, um, Palo Alto, a few left in LA. Um, you want to get us there at GaiaLeadershipProject.com backslash ECM dash live. Okay. Um, questions today largely revolve around this effort by DeSantis to defund the Mueller investigation. So I want to kind of tell you guys how this works from a legal standpoint, because I know there's a lot of panic about it out there in the field. First things first, I think there's not a chance in hell that it's going to pass. Paul Ryan himself is on the record saying that um, he thinks Mueller should be allowed to do his job. So what the amendment says is that the Mueller investigation would be defunded six months after the amendment passes. This is an amendment, by the way, to the federal budget, the whole thing that like Trump is you know, threatening to shut down if they don't fund the wall. Um, there's a lot, like hundreds of other amendments to be considered. This is only one. Um, and the other thing about this that you should be aware of is that, of course, like any other amendment to any other bill, it has to pass by... Um, a majority of the Senate and a majority of the House in order to get through and then be signed by the president into law. Amendments themselves can hold up entire bills. Um, so we've got a long way to go until this is even like a remote possibility. And I don't I think the effort behind it is probably um, the Republican reflection of what could happen here in light of, say, what happened in the Bill Clinton in investigation, where it started off being about a land deal in Arkansas and ended up being about a blue dress um, and Monica Lewinsky. I think the effort there is to kind of try to curtail the scope of it. You know, DeSantis himself is on record as saying there's no basis for this investigation. Um, I don't think there's a legitimate chance in hell that it's going to pass. So I am not panicked about it. I think, of course, it is media newsworthy. Um, you know, obviously, this is something to mention if and when you are calling your representatives, as you should be. <laughs> um, but, but just keep in mind um, that it's, we have a long way to go until we actually get there. Um, all right. The other thing that I just wanted to mention briefly today is that we had a, we've had a mountain of breaking news in the last 24 hours concerning this Trump Tower Moscow deal that Trump was negotiating while he was running for president. And this swath of emails that was disclosed last night in the New York Times between Michael Cohen and Felix Sater. Um, some of you asked, why is this being leaked in advance of these documents being turned over? That's a very good question. You know, my bet is that just in the same way that when you go to trial, if you have bad evidence, you want to be the person who discloses it, not the other side, because then it looks more damning. Some effort is being made to do that here. But let me just say one thing, like evidence is evidence. No matter who discloses it to the public, it doesn't change what's written in those emails. And the Seder emails in particular are beyond damning. They're about the fact that like he can get Putin's people on deck to throw the election you know, basically in exchange for this Trump Moscow deal. So it's, you know, fundamentally the evidence is there. Um, as I said last night on the feed, though, the real question that I still have outstanding is what Trump knew and when he knew it. Because the further into this we get and the deeper into this we get, the plainer it becomes that, like, the entire mechanism of the Trump campaign was involved in some way or another in getting Russia on board with this effort. So the real issue now is what did the candidate know and when did he know it? So I said last night, what I'm waiting for is the emails that have been CC'd to Trump that say, okay, we've got Russia on board or we're taking this meeting with Russia to try to determine what they can do to help us in the campaign. Um, it, but just know this, no matter how this gets out in the free press, it's still evidence. Mueller's still going to get it. He can still use it in a criminal prosecution. The evidence doesn't go away or get changed or anything. This is just an effort to spin the outcome um, of what it means. But it doesn't change the fact that the evidence exists. So nothing to worry about there.
okay, on that front. Um, what I will say, though, is that the additional bit of breaking news about Trump yesterday that we all really should be paying attention to is that Mueller is looking very closely now at this at the, um, the efforts that were made by Trump on Air Force One on the way back from the G20 to write that statement on behalf of Don Jr. about what took place in that meeting in June of 2016. That in and of itself, and I said this at the time that the news of this came out, and literally when we found out that he had written the statement, that the effort to do it and describe it as a meeting that was just about adoptions came from the top, like the president himself sat on Air Force One and wrote this statement and made it more um, more um, misleading than it than had been recommended even by his closest advisors. That in and of itself looks very much like obstruction of justice. And the question that we all need to be asking ourselves, given that Mueller is now very focused on Trump's role in particular in writing that particular statement, is what he had to hide. Because fundamentally, obstruction of justice can still get him impeached, but he doesn't have any reason to be writing a misleading statement about what took place in a meeting a year and a half ago, um, or a year and two months ago, whatever it was, unless... There's something at the base of that meeting that is damning to him personally. Um, I don't think the man gives a crap about his, whether his son goes to prison. There's something deeper there going on that caused him to take the valuable time flying back from the G20 on Air Force One to reword that statement so that it was misleading to the press and misleading to the American people. Um, so that combined with what we have, we know right now, that continues to leak out from Felix Sater and from Michael Cohen and from others, um, it is once again growing what we've talked about before, this circumstantial case that right now is only circumstantial, that the president knew what was going on. Um, what we don't have yet is the smoking gun email, phone call that's recorded, um, you know, testimony from someone who was in one of these meetings that they then went to Trump and said, Russia's on board to help swing the election, or we're trying to get Russia on board to swing the election, because by the way, attempt is also a crime here. Um, you know, all of this combined together does make for a very compelling circumstantial case that Trump knew all along what was going on. You know, the fact that he was involved in rewriting this statement would certainly lead to that conclusion. We just don't have the smoking gun yet. We may not need it. I just want you to know that. Like cases are cases have been made as I've said many times before in this broadcast. People have been convicted of murder without a body. So, you know, know that um, we may not need the direct evidence that Trump himself knew, but my bet and I said this last night on the feed, my bet as a lawyer and a, a, you know, a former litigator and someone who took depositions and went through documents and took testimony and went to trial is telling me that there's a smoking gun out there about this because there's no way that Trump didn't know what was going on. The question is, what is the evidence that he did? Um, and my bet is that Mueller probably already has it or that it's somewhere in this, these swaths of emails that continue to get leaked. Um, Keep in mind that, you know, especially Felix Sater, who has already gone to prison, may have a very strong motivation to flip. Um, and I, I will also just add, you know, Mueller has a lot of people on his team now who have worked uh, to prosecute mafioso figures um, and work to get them to flip on the boss. So there is a lot of legal expertise in Mueller's team around cyber crimes crime families, organized crime, flipping witnesses, um, you know, it, financial crimes, money laundering, all the sorts of things that are potentially implicated with what we have here. So we have a lot going on here um, around what could potentially implicate the president. And I hope you all are feeling what I was feeling yesterday, which is that there's a culmination right now that is pushing all this all the way up to the top. Um, and we'll have, to, we'll have to see when we get there. Um, so um, all that said, you know, I want to just encourage you all to continue to do a couple of things. Please make sure you're continuing to call your reps and your senators. Somebody asked this morning, by the way, on the feed about the issue of the 25th Amendment and whether or not it was appropriate to push for the 25th um, before pushing for impeachment because uh, the longer that he was there, the more likely it was that he could pardon people or for that matter, we have this whole Nor North Korea re reborn situation happening right now this morning um, with North Korea having launched a missile into Japanese airspace. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying like we should invoke the 25th Amendment tomorrow. 
just keep in mind that the as I've been saying, like you know, for months and months and months and months now, these are not just legal considerations; they're also political. And without the appropriate, you know, support, none of this is going to work. So. I don't really care what you push for to get him out of office, honestly, other than that you push for it. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I would like the 25th Amendment first and impeachment otherwise, or to say, I want impeachment, like impeach him now. It doesn't really matter. The point, what matters the most is that there is constant, continuous flow of resistance-related phone calls, faxes, postcards, two representatives and senators saying like, get him out, just get him out. Like, we don't really care how you do it, get him out. Um, okay. I think that's it for today. I want to say one other thing. I've had a number of requests over the last couple of days, again, since our Sunday broadcast, to talk a little bit more about surviving narcissistic abuse. Um, I spent, as all of you who watch Sunday's broadcast know, I spent like a solid 20 minutes talking about that on Sunday's broadcast. If you didn't see it, I encourage you to go back and find it. The book that I'm referring everyone to right now, which is you know a mammoth book on narcissistic, narcissistic abuse, narcissistic personality disorders, the things that it does in our bodies, the things that it does um, for us in the context of trauma is Becoming the Narcissist Nightmare by Shahida Arabi. I do encourage all of you to go out and buy it if you haven't yet. I know many of you are reading it on the feed. Um, and I just really, 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 really want you all to be doing what you need to do to kind of continue to um, get through this particular experience. Because the other thing that I just want to remind you is that while there will be relief in what, however this process starts to get him out of office, we will not be done um, even when he goes. Um, and while we will all celebrate and we'll drink our impeachment drinks or we'll do whatever it is that we're going to do, um, you know. By the way, I want to warn you something of something really interesting that I mentioned about that book on Sunday, which is that excessive drinking is a sign of narcissistic trauma. It's a sign of lots of other things. But for those of you who have found your alcohol consumption going through the roof since the president was inaugurated, I just want to tell you, like, pay attention to that. Like, pay attention, okay? Because it's not just about like a, you know, a standard coping mechanism. It's actually something that in terms of self-harm is an internal reflection of the experience of narcissistic abuse. So please be mindful if your drinking is getting excessive or your consumption of other substances for that matter is getting excessive to take care of yourself and be very careful. All that said, the point of all of this is that we have a long way to go. And even while there is immediate relief you know, if and when he is removed, um, the reality is that even beyond that, we're going to have a heck of a time moving forward with whomever is the next president until we get to the 2020 elections through the 2018 elections. We've got a lot to worry about there. Um, and, you know, we've also got a lot to do in terms of like rebuilding our democracy one, you know, if and when it happens. So fingers crossed that this is sooner rather than later. I will also just add that, um, you know, I, I always know whenever the president is tweeting irrationally that, uh, you know, I've mentioned this on the feed before, that there's something big about Russia coming. Please keep in mind that he tweeted like 10 or 15 times. Um, somebody clearly said to him, you ought to be tweeting about Harvey. Um, you know, it, it, irrational, nonsensical stuff and stuff that showed no compassion that was like, it's the biggest storm ever. Woohoo! Um, all of that um, is an indication that there are things going on in the background that we don't know about that are about to break. That's the first thing, because keep in mind that when stories like what broke in the New York Times break, uh, the one that broke last night, they are usually reaching out to Trump officials 24 hours in advance for a comment. So there's a very predictable sense of this news cycle, right? When he's tweeting irrationally and in crazy town mode, you know that that's when something big is coming. Um, and I just want to remind all of you of one other thing um, that I just, you know, on the narcissistic personality disorder front that I think is really important to reiterate, and it is this. Um, one of the ways that we recover from narcissistic abuse is to stop putting the idea that our morality applies to the narcissistic abuser onto that person, meaning that um, he's never going to act normally. He's never going to have compassion for people who are losing their homes or dying or being evacuated out of Houston. Um, he's not capable of compassion. So the one thing that I will say about that from where we sit is that um, the outrage is palpable and 
we also should all be getting to the point right now of expecting nothing different. And that, by the way, is a very good thing for your own personal central nervous system. If you can match the expectations to his actual behavior, which is that he is literally incapable of caring about another human being other than himself, the only thing that matters to him is whether or not he is getting praise and his narcissistic supply is being met and whether or not he is envious of someone else. That's literally it. So we cannot expect any shift of behavior from the president of the United States. We could have a mass, mass casualty event in this nation, and he would probably be tweeting about how it was the biggest mass, mass casualty that the nation had ever seen, woohoo. No difference there. Don't expect anything different. We'll all be better off if we recognize that there's no hope here, right? Like we can't convince him to behave any differently. We can't expect him to change his behavior. The only thing we can do is cut out his base. And that is the reason why all of our tweets, phone calls, faxes, postcards have to be going to Republicans in addition to the people who represent you if you happen to live in a blue state. So keep fighting. Um, remember that this will come to an end. And the only question now is when. I did call August. I know we've got one day left in the month. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Um, but I still have the sense right now, by the way, that we are getting awfully close to something big. Um, and, and that is in part because Mueller's investigation continues to get ramped up more and more and more and more as we hear about it and we have grand juries convened and once they have enough evidence indictments will issue and a report can be sent over to the house to start the process of impeachment full bore so um stay tuned just stay tuned um all right everybody take care of yourselves i will be back tomorrow at 11 a.m as well sending you all lots of love and um get some rest today because i have a feeling that while the president is flying to texas we're going to have a little bit of a break here all right take care everyone bye